Good morning. At least I'm six feet away from you. In fact, maybe six miles. This corona coronavirus has sure caused lots of interesting problems, hasn't it? We in Mary's Woods are almost in lockdown, uh, only getting out occasionally and having our meals delivered to us in our rooms. So life is different. Pastor Michelle has been focusing our attention these last few weeks on the monastic disciplines of St. Benedict. He says that a balanced life should include work, community, prayer, and rest. And when these are in balance, they offer the psychological foundation for a healthy life. I want you to think back with me this morning over a few days. Did you get enough time to relax, to rest, to sleep? Did you feel overly busy, overly stimulated? Were you hassled? Did you have one, two, three, or maybe a dozen more things on your plate than you could possibly deal with? And do you ever feel that to do one more thing would be a straw that just might break your back? I know a young mother back in the Midwest, an employee of one of the universities there, whose schedule just caught up with her and finally overwhelmed her. Her job required long hours, and she did a lot of pro bono work for a not-for-profit. She took her six-year-old to school at eight in the morning and then returned after work at six to pick the child up. And then there were errands to do, household work, social obligations. Things were just spinning out of control. Commitments and tasks seemed to fill every day and they were no longer fun. Well, all of this was cutting into her sleep and she wasn't eating well and self-care just fell off her list completely. And then she was so worn out that the relationships began to, to suffer with her husband. And the family got strained and finally she wound up in the hospital totally ill. Yet yeah, once you are committed to all these scheduled things in your, in, in, your, in your life, how do you stop? How do you relax and rest? Well, researchers on rest and sleep say that 60% of Americans don't get enough rest or sleep. My friend needed rest. Rest provides the space to nurture our lives through prayer, seeking wisdom, and thinking in ways that prompts us to see problems through to the other side. But in this age of fake news, information overload, and social media stress, we can easily lose our sensibilities. We can easily find that we have just too much going on in our lives. And all of a sudden, we do feel, say, and think strange things. This applies to political and corporate leaders, Indeed, it applies to managers, to housewives, to you, to me, to blue and collar workers, to students, to everyone else. So with so much pressure and information thrown at us, it's just hard to stay calm and confident. We can't make sense of it. Rest simply avoids us. And when that happens in life, it's kind of like a washing machine that gets a load out of balance and starts clanging and banging and finally it gets so rattled, so banging that it just totally stops. Or life can become like a thumping tire that's so radically out of balance that finally just wears out. An out of balance life is never a restful life. So what are the things we can do to bring balance into our lives? Out of entire possibilities, endless possibilities, let me suggest just four. Sabbath is essentially for, essential for a balanced life. In order to find restful balance in our lives, we must be present, alive, and living in the moment. Talmud scholars argue that Sabbath is emphasized in the Genesis not because God needed rest, but because rest is demanded as an element in the creation process. Think about that. God looked at what had been created 
and saw that it was simply good. Think about that. The rabbis taught the purpose of the Sabbath is to give time to evaluate our work, as God did, to see that it was good. And finally, the Sabbath, they pointed out, was one-seventh of our life, one-seventh of our time. In a year, it was 52 days. In 10, 70 years, it was 3,640 days, or 10 years of Sabbath for rest and reflection. Sabbath, in other words, is designed to be used as a period of holy leisure when we take time to view life in fresh new ways. But my question this morning is, where do we find the balance we need in a society that itself is totally out of balance? Where do we find Sabbath in a culture that hasn't destroyed the night with perpetual light and keeps the equipment going 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because it's more costly to turn machines on and off than it is to pay somebody to run them in these strange and difficult hours. I could argue that our culture has corrupted Sabbath. We have some grandkids who have to work seven days and then they're off two days, which means that their two days off always are going at a different time during the week. For them, life is discombobulated because it doesn't fit the life of the rest of the family. They can't be at the family gatherings. They can't do the things that we do on weekends. They are out of balance with the rest of the society. So I believe that Sabbath is the foundation for a creative life. I believe that creativity requires Sabbath. It's in the times that we rest that we have breakthroughs in our thinking and in our different our problems. Sabbath should be a period when we take time to look at life in fresh and new ways. It's a time to examine our lives. After all, the sages do say an unexamined life is not worth living. I think another prerequisite for a balanced and restful life might be a life that's in harmony with itself, but also a life that knows how to play. Most of us have some downtime. Let us, yet many of us, have lost our ability to creatively use what downtime and leisure we do have. Leisure has two purposes in my mind, play and rest. Often, the paradox is, if we can't play, we can't rest. Today is Donna and my wedding anniversary. One of my requests of Donna, when we were committing to each other, was teach me how to play. It's still a goal. Indeed, play for adults is more than ever, almost has to be relearned. So much of what we think of as play is simply a special kind of work. We used to play pickup ball, you know, in the lot someplace, but now we organize some very sophisticated ball leagues into competition. And some of the parents become so downright nasty to a volunteer umpire, like I was for a while, that it makes almost no fun for anyone. In fact, it got so bad one night in New Jersey when I was doing this that we just had to call the game. Or we buy a Peloton for home exercise. But soon we are racing others someplace else in the world. Some for relaxation, yes. But for others, this becomes tiring work. I love to run for relaxation up until my 70s. And when I was in high school and college, I was glad to participate in cross country and track. But after college, to run became a competitive fashion. It was too much like work. It was not fun. So I always ran by myself. I disciplined myself to run 35 miles a week, week in, week out, year in, year out, decade in, decade out. It was time for me, time for myself, time for meditation, time for relaxation. It was exercise, but it was also rest. 
So many things we do for relaxation creates tension, not rest. The movies are violent, oft times, and very expensive. The toys for our children are expensive. We give them those great educational toys, and soon they're out in the backyard playing with a the stick they found. I once paid big money for a ski boat, and at a different time, a travel trailer. Both of them designed to help me get away and play. But I only used them occasionally. It seemed like life was too full to get away. But I spent an awful lot of time out in the yard caring for them washing them, waxing them, and so on, or paying somebody to park in their, in their parking driveway. Play has become big business in America, in the United States. It's costly and it's often not leisure, nor is it restful. It often becomes mind-bending, spirit-numbing, and indeed, very expensive work. Play in America has in many ways betrayed us, becoming another expensive burden, and there is no rest in our play. My plea after 35, 85 years, teach me how to play. A third thing, St. Benedict says that a person who wants to rest well must be involved in a supportive community, must most of us are part of several communities, the work community, the recreation community, the family, the local associations, the faith community, the neighborhood, and the list goes on and on and on. One or two of these usually become our primary community. And it's the role of these primary communities to support you in living throughout your life in a productive way. Not all communities, however, are productive or are they helpful? But your home and your faith community should be. So my question is, where is the community that for you nurtures you in this time when our nation is so polarized? It seems there are no agreed upon national values or goals. Where are your values nurtured? And if we do not have a primary community, where do you find security? Indeed, where can you find rest when all around us seems to be in chaos? And finally this morning, I would argue the life uh, that it can rest must be balanced through a flow from life's purpose, from meaningful work. I believe each of us is given life for one unique purpose, and that one thing, our talents, our education, our loves, are things that point us in the one thing that we should be doing here on earth. It's my observation that we Americans often do not get enough rest because we are not engaged in what we've been put on earth to do. We are preoccupied with trivia. Doing things that do not really matter is trivia. Rather than searching and embracing our real life purpose, we often are engaged in trivia. That is, many tend to float through life with tension caused by ne never seriously clarifying our life purpose. Some of you may have met Michelle D. Jones, the founder of a Wayfinding Academy here in Portland. It's a two-year college for people who want to find their purpose in life before starting their college majors and major field of study. As a tenured professor in New England and Texas, Dr. Jones noted that far too many of her students graduated from college and were very unclear about their life purpose or what they really should be doing with their lives, with their education, with their talents. And she found that too many of her students, two and three years out of college, were really foundering and uncertain, ill at ease, didn't know what to do. Here they were with college degrees, but they were taking jobs as bartenders or baristas placeholder jobs, to be sure, until they figured out what they really should do with their life. She founded this academy as a two-year academic full credit program in collaboration with PSU. It was designed to help students of all ages explore their life purpose before choosing 
a college major. And then even if they were clear about their life purpose, we still sometimes get nudged off path, don't we? I have a good friend who, uh, from Ridgewood, New Jersey, used to teach our adult Sunday school class part of the time. His name was Ray Shaw, and he was a journalist, a native of Oklahoma, a Westerner. Early in his career, he was made the Dow Jones correspondent for the West. Journalism was his life. He did so well, however, that they transferred him to New York to take over the Asia regional desk for the whole corporation. Now, he did some writing for the paper yet, but increasingly it seemed to me he was having a difficult time fitting into the New York culture or the state blue chip Wall Street company culture. Then the company, in its wisdom, elevated him to be the editor-in-chief of the Wall Street Journal. No small job, in fact, a very important job, a prestigious job in New York circles. But it seemed like he was wrestling to fit in. And then, strangely enough, within a very short time, they elevated him to become president of the Dow Jones Corporation. Nothing but politics and administration doing the things that the corporation bid him do. Now this small town Oklahoma born journalist found the work not so difficult, but the cultural expectations were just too stifling. He had been nudged and nudged and nudged a little further up, up the ladder, but he was setting, finding no satisfaction. The culture of this blue chip corporation was far too constraining and far from his open lifestyle and his purpose of being an organization builder and a journalist. For example, the corporation expected its editor and later its president to be picked up every morning from his home and driven to work by the company. Company, company limo. Yes, that big black thing. Ray had always commuted to work by train and subway since he was in the New York area. He would not ride in a limo. It was just not part of his value structure. But finally, they compromised. The driver would come to his house each morning and drive him to work in Ray's 10-year-old Volvo. Ray did agree to ride in the back seat because it was safer back there and he could do a little work. But Ray was not a conformist, an innovator. He was maintaining the status, maintaining the status quo was not his life purpose. But over a short time, you could see he was restless. I could see that what was happening to him was shocking. He looked tired and was almost haggard. The mold corporate politics tried to force him into was literally killing him. No fulfillment, no rest. And so in order to save his life, less than two years after he was made the president, he resigned one day and the world was shocked. The Wall Street world couldn't believe it. And we in Ridgewood, New Jersey, who knew him so well, were also shocked. But the very next day after he resigned, he got on an airplane and went to South Carolina. He had picked up a job there that was to last him the rest of his life. He went down there to become the editor of a small business journal. And by the time he died accidentally, because he was killed by the bee, by a bite from a honeybee, or Bumblebee, uh, he was presiding over an empire of 1,900 employees and more than 40 small magazines and art, uh, publications. So how many of us are uptight and on edge because we are doing something we even know deep down is out of balance and limit our, it limits our ability in, uh, to be in harmony with ourselves? and thus always finds us restless. Sometimes we're unable to sleep, and in the end, if we make no changes, there is no satisfaction. We look at our work, and we find that it is not meaningful. It burn, we burn out. First Genesis creation story tells us that when the Creator finished the work of creation, God looked at it 
and said that it was very good. God was satisfied with the creation. And in the end, if we look at our work and find no satisfaction with it, and we can't see that it was very good, we are either doing the wrong work or maybe an insufferable perfectionist. Either way, we can have no rest. Exhaustion becomes our companion. John Wesley taught his followers to greet one another each week with the question, brother, sister, how is it with your soul? Is your life productive? Is your life in harmony with you, your family, your friends, and fellow workers? Are your values nurtured by your communities, your family, your church? Indeed, is your life in balance? Strange ideas in these times, perhaps, but ideas which can help us deal with the chaos and burnout we often face daily. The good news this morning, the good news is that true rest, rooted in a life of purpose, a life that knows how to relax and play, a life nurtured and supported by a healthy community, and a life which understands its creativity depends on the need for Sabbath, allows us to unplug so that we can plug into something much more life-giving.